question. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. This is the joint meeting of the Patuxent Bird Club and Prince George's Audubon Society. I'm Marsha Watson, and I'm the president of the Patuxent Bird Club. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce my husband. I don't get a chance to say that very often, but I'm introducing my husband, Gene Scarpula, who will give us an introductory overview of shorebird identification. Um, a few words about Gene. He is a Maryland native, having grown up in Towson, just outside Baltimore. He earned both a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Biology with a concentration in ecology from Towson University. For over 30 years, he worked for the city of Baltimore in the city's reservoir and natural resources section. And for the last eight years of that, he was the watershed manager. He was in charge of Pretty Boy, Lock Raven and Liberty Reservoirs and the watersheds surrounding them. Gene is now retired and the two of us live in Bowie. Gene serves as the editor of Maryland BirdLife and also of the Maryland Entomologist, which is the scientific journal of the Maryland Entomological Society. I also wanted to mention that for several years in the early 90s, 1990s, Gene had a company called Atlantic Seabirds that offered pelagic birding trips in Maryland waters. So I would now like to turn it over to Gene. Take it away, Gene. Okay. Let's share screen and should be this. All right, how's that look? That's good. All right, let me uh, get rid of this on the side here. Okay. So, Shorebirds 101. Uh, Marsha had asked me about doing something on shorebirds, uh, kind of as an introductory course. And I agreed to this many months ago. Um, so this is the results of that. Uh, and I, I'll mention up front and I'll mention at the end that the majority of these photos that are in the presentation are the courtesy of Bill Hubick and Jim Stass. Uh, who I can't thank enough uh, for providing these photos for me to use. Okay, I guess that will not change. That will not change. So, okay, why am I not able to change? There we go. Okay, now it'll change. Ah, uh, so a few things. One, it's impossible to teach everything about shorebirds in one hour. Uh, this would take many, many, many hours of workshops to teach everything. And of course, it's also impossible to learn everything about shorebirds in an hour. But hopefully, this presentation will make you want to get out in the field. Uh, and that's the best way to learn them. Have your field guide and get out in the field and observe. What the talk is, uh, it's kind of a starting point, where to look to identify the more common shorebirds. And I'm going to emphasize the structure, habitat that the birds live in, where in Maryland you might be able to find them, uh, what season of the year, and how to separate similar species. What I'm not going to be talking about is how to find or identify rarities. Uh, that's another whole presentation that could be put together. Uh, and I will not be emphasizing the different plumages. Uh, there are several plumages throughout the year. I will mention some of those for some of the species, but uh, it's way too much to try and get into all the different plumages. So what are shorebirds? They are in the order Charadriaformes. And uh, primarily in Maryland, we have four families. There are other families that exist, but primarily we had four in Maryland. Uh, the stilts and avocets, the oyster catchers, the plovers, and the sandpipers. And we'll go through each of these groups and you can see where the bulk of these fall in the, under the term sandpipers. So what are shorebirds? Well, you can find shorebirds along the shorelines, 
in mud flats and grasslands, uh, marshes, places like that. Generally, for most shorebirds, it's places that are wet, but that's not always the case. Uh, generally, they're feeding on invertebrates, and you can find them running, walking, wading, and even swimming. Uh, and like I said, the plumage varies throughout the entire year. And some of these you can identify easily by their vocalizations. And again, that's another whole presentation that could be put together. So I won't be concentrating on vocalizations, except in a few cases. And not everything at the shore is a shorebird, and not all shorebirds are at the shore. So what are not shorebirds? Waterfowl aren't shorebirds. Any of the seabirds that you would generally see at sea or around the sea are not shorebirds. None of the waders, the herons, egrets, ibises, and not rails either. None of these are considered shorebirds. So how did I get started? Back around 1994, and I don't know for certain because all of my data got lost in Hurricane Isabel, but somewhere back in 1994-ish, uh, I started going to Bombay Hook every Saturday. And I started in early May and went till the end of October. So I got to see the different plumages of birds and the structures of them. And I could see them as they were going from their winter plumage into breeding plumage, and then molting into non-breeding plumage, and then in the fall migration, especially in, in uh, August, to see what the juvenile plumages look like. So it was interesting, again, to see all these different plumages, but it's the same structure for the bird. And of course, that's what I'm going to concentrate on, the structures. Then after that, I spent a lot of Saturdays at Hart Miller Island Dredge Material Containment Facility. And I started that in May 1996 for an MOS field trip for a conference field trip that was held in Baltimore. And I know Fred and Jane, you were on that, on that trip with me. So I started in May and I went the next week and there were still shorebirds. And then the following week, and there were more shorebirds. Well, I ended up going every Saturday and did that pretty much through 2008. And uh, again, got to learn shorebirds quite well out there. And I also mentioned gulls and terns. Uh, that was very good learning opportunity out of Hart Miller Island. So I'm going to be stressing the structure, the behavior, the habitat, not so much plumage, but I will get into a little bit. And then in most cases, and at least in many cases, more than one field mark is needed to make an ID. Uh, you can't always just go by one field mark. So for structure, we're gonna look at the size of the bird, basically how long it is. When they measure sizes for birds, it's from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. Uh, I would rather they did it for a standing bird from the feet up to the top of the head, but that's not the way field guides are set up. So we'll have that uh, look at the body types and the shape of the bodies. Are they chunky? Are they slim? Are they elongated? L bill shapes can be very telling as to what the species is, uh, the length of it and the shape of the bill. Uh, head, whoop, there we go, head shape. Uh, is good. Leg, leg length is also helpful. Primary extension, what we're talking about there, and I'll show you a slide coming up, uh, is basically how long the primary feathers are extending past the tertial feathers. Or that can also discuss how long the primary feathers are extending past the tail. Uh, we'll also look at posture, because some birds are very upright and others are very horizontal. Uh, and again, posture, how they are look, and that's affected by their structure. Uh, for habitat, where they hang out, feeding style, we'll be looking at probing, scything. Scything is basically the bird swinging its bill back and forth in the water, just picking things off the surface. And then calls and vocalizations, what they say. And again, I'll only cover a few of those. 
with plumage, we'll look at leg colors, bill colors, the overall color tone, and the color of specific feather groups uh, in certain cases, and any obvious field marks. So I'll mention plumages, uh, like I said, in the springtime when birds are arriving, uh, many of them are in striking breeding plumage, very colorful in April and May. Uh, but not all are. Uh, things such as sanderlings don't get their breeding plumage full until they're on the breeding grounds up in the Arctic. But uh, a lot of these, a lot of the species will be in breeding plumage in, uh, in May in particular. And uh, so you'll see them molting into breeding plumage as well as being in breeding plumage. Fall migration, most of them are going out of breeding plumage at that point. And you see all different combinations of what they look like, either going still in breeding plumage or transitional and going into winter plumage. And they can look so different. And then the juveniles. The juveniles are pretty. Uh, in August, you can find these juveniles. They can be striking because juvenile feathers all grow out at the same time. That's the only time they do that on a bird, uh, on these juveniles. They'll all come out the same time. The feathers are all pristine. They have bright feather edgings around them. Uh, very, very pretty looking. And they look very scaly because of that feather edging around each feather. Uh, and we won't get too much into all of this, but I will mention a few of these things that I'll mention tonight. The eye line goes through the eye, the supercilium above the eye, this line. Uh, the crown of the, of the birds on their head. Uh, then this I'll just call upper parts through most of the presentation. And I mentioned the primary projection and the tertials. The tertials are right here and the primary stick out beyond the tertials. And depending on, they can be very short or they can be very long past the tertials and that can help you identify birds. Uh, and we'll also talk about the the different markings on these tertials. That can be very telling as well. Uh, underneath, uh, I'll mention vent colors in one instance, uh, but we'll deal with the flanks and markings on the flanks of the bird and also on the bellies and the breast. And then as far as the wings, there's a few things. Uh, I'll mention the rump color on a few of these as well as the upper tail coverts that can be diagnostic for some of these and also wing bars on a few of these. And I'll mention armpits here. When we talk about armpits in birds, we're basically talking about the axillaries and the feathers on the body right in here. And you'll see that uh, shortly as well. And let me take a sip. When birds are in flight, that's when you'll see these rump and upper tail covers and the axillaries, wing stripes. Uh, that can be very, very good then. And leg extensions, how far the legs extend beyond the tail when they're in flight, or if in fact they even do extend beyond the tail. So I'll mention the breeding bird atlas since we're in year two of this. Uh, there are eight species of shorebirds that breed in Maryland. Uh, these are the ones that are in black, and we'll be covering each of these in the presentation. But Wilson's Plover uh, was a historical breeder. There has been, as far as I know, no recent uh, breeding records of these in Maryland. Wilson's Snipe is an unknown, where it's possibly a breeder in Western Maryland, possibly in Garrett County, but this has never been confirmed. So this would be nice if it got confirmed this year that Wilson Snipe are a breeder. So we'll start with the first family, the stilts and avocets. It's the family Recurvarostidae, and that means bent back bill. And we have two Maryland species, and these are both unmistakable. Black neck stilts, the most, and well, I'll mention the size first. American avocets are a little bit bigger, 18 inch versus 14 inch. But the most important things to know about black neck stilts is that they have a black neck. And that's there in all plumages. Uh, the female has a brown back. This is probably a female in this photo, uh, as opposed to a black back in males. But 
that black neck is always there. And they are very vocal. If they're ever around their breeding grounds, they're constantly yip, 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 the whole time you're there. Now with avocets, of course, breeding plumage ones are very bright, rusty colored. Males have a straight bill. Females have can have a very turned up bill. Uh, but in non-breeding plumage, they're white necked. So the, again, the most important thing is the black neck for all plumages for black neck stilts, and it's this white wing patch that's there for all plumages of avocets. So in winter plumage, you can tell them apart non-breeding plumage, either if they have that white patch or the black neck. Then the oyster catcher family. We only have one species here in Maryland, and hematopode means blood red foot, which to me is a misnamer because I think they ought to be called blood red bill. Uh, the most brilliant thing about these birds are the large, thick, bright red, orange bills that they have. Uh, they're just striking when you see them. And you'll also notice a bright orbital eye, or the bright red orbital ring around the eyes. Uh, it's hard to not be able to find something like this. And places to go, Lower Eastern Shore, coastal areas, that's your best place for looking for these. Then we're into the plovers and the charadriidae, uh, which charadrius is plover, but that comes from the word meaning gully, which is allegedly where that's where they were found nesting in these gullies. And we have primarily five species here in the Maryland. And I broke these down into three categories, the double breast bands, the single breast bands, and the no breast bands. And we'll go through each one of these groups. So double banded, there's only one species here, it's killdeer. They're medium sized, uh, 10 and a half inches. They're the only one with two breast bands and they are very vociferous if you've ever been around them, constantly calling out killdeer, killdeer, killdeer. Very common Maryland breeder. They're permanent here year round and found in all counties. Uh, they can be found on pretty much any type of habitat. Uh, fields, mudflats, uh, we've had them nesting in our parking lots, uh, on gravel parking lots at our office that we'd have to build, uh, put up traffic cones around them so, so that the uh, kill deer wouldn't be run over. So the only time they are not double banded the young ones, uh, these little fluffy juveniles only have one band. And then as they grow, they develop the two bands that the adults would have. Then the single bandits. These are both about the same size, around seven and a quarter inches. And the main difference is the color of the backs and the heads. Uh, you'll notice here with the semi-palmated, it's the color of the mud that they're generally on. You'll find these on lots of mud flats, cotton mud flats in particular. Uh, they have a thicker breast band as well. But then if you look at the piping plovers, these are the color of sand. And that's where they nest on the beaches, uh, primarily Assateague Island is what we're talking about. And uh, they're here in the summertime, you can find them on acetate. Uh, whereas the other ones, the uh, semi palmated plovers, they're generally here, you'll find them mostly during migration, spring and fall migration, and they're possible in all counties as they move through. But as far as pipings, uh, Worcester County. And now we get into a little trickier ones. And again, I have a like a big list of things here, but I'll mention the important things. And I, generally, those are the ones I have asterisks and I have them underlined. But black bellied plover is bigger than American golden plover. They're chunkier in size, they have larger heads, they have rounder heads, thicker necks, and short primaries. The primaries don't go very far here, they're just kind of there. Whereas on a Golden plover, they're much longer. They stick out farther. 
and this is, an, again, in all plumages. And this is one of the species that I will discuss in plumages. Breeding plumage, they're easy to separate. The vent colors are white. On black belly, vent colors are black. On the golden plover. Also the heads, the head is black if they have a dark crown, whereas black bellies have a white crown. And then the overall coloration is black and white for black bellied plovers. Whereas down here, you'll notice this golden coloration that they get during breeding plumage. Uh, and they're, they're striking. Now, the thing with golden plovers though, they are primarily a fall migrant. So you don't often see them in this breeding plumage. They do occur in Maryland, a few in the springtime, but they're more of a fall migrant. So in the fall, you're gonna see birds that look like this. And again, look at the structure. See how the bill is larger in the upper bird versus the golden plover. They have a thinner, thinner bill. The head is smaller in the golden plover and a little flatter on top, not as rounded. The neck is thinner and the longer primaries you can see here kind of sticking out. Whereas up here, they're barely beyond the tail, but here they are beyond the tail. And then in flight, this, this is a clincher. If you see plovers in flight, if you're not sure what they are on the ground, once they get in flight, if they have black armpits during any of their plumages, they're black-bellied plovers. If they have pale armpits, then they're golden plovers. And you will also see a white rump in, plume, in uh, flight, as well as a dark, dark rump in flight for the golden plovers. But that black armpit, that you've cinched it at that point, it's a black-bellied plover. And there, I'll mention their wing stripes. It's a little wider in a black-bellied plover. It's it's not as not as thick. It's it's thinner and fainter in these American golden plovers. But look for that armpit, black armpits. Now the sandpipers. Uh, there's a gazillion species, <coughs> and I think I'm going to need a throat lozenge here. Okay, I'll talk about the larger sandpipers first. The godwits are unmistakable if you see them. They're not that common. I would call them kind of uncommon, but uh, I wouldn't call them a rarity. So I included them. Marble godwit, that's the bigger one, 18 inches. They both have these long bicolored bills. And they're slightly curved up, recurved, and it's curved up. And they both have long, dark legs. Now, in breeding plumage, the Hudsonians will have a grayish back and reddish underneath. And I'll mention this because of the photos. <laughs> I have a great respect now for photography and bird photographers. It is hard to get to show all the characteristics of a bird from a photograph because birds don't always cooperate with you. They're not always facing the way you want them to face to see the characteristics. So you have, you know, putting this presentation together, I went with what I had to get here. Um, but in breeding plumage, they're reddish underneath. And once they raise their wings, the black wing linings. Now on this, these are always tawny colored, co colored overall. This very cinnamony, cinnamony, buffy color. And once they raise their wings, it's a uh, very cinnamony, cinnamony, buffy wing linings that you would see. So they're very distinctive between the two of them. Uh, the first time I saw a big flock of these, I was thinking, oh my gosh, these are long-billed dowagers. These are incredibly long bills, but uh, obviously they weren't. 
uh, which I came to realize quickly that, no, wait a minute, I've got a flock of Hudsonian godwits here. Then Wimbrels, another unmistakable one. Very large, direct bird. Uh, the things to look for on this bird, this long, decurved bill. And the brown striped head. You'll see these stripes going across the head. Find them on salt marshes. And again, these are here during migration. Sometimes you can get many of these. You can get good sized flocks of these coming through. They'll be there one day and gone the next. Another one of these taller ones, upland sandpipers, very erect posture. Look at the neck, how long and thin it is. A uh, very small head. The head looks way too small for the body. And the eye looks very big for the body. Uh, these are easy to pick out uh, if they're not standing in too high vegetation. You might only see their head. But uh, look for these on, uh, in the fall, primarily, on turf farms and farm fields. And these have very long wings and very long tails. Now, I'll mention the long-legged waders. I'm going to deal with three <clears throat> willets. I'll mention the eastern willet, which is the one that breeds here in Maryland. Western willets breed out in the western US. Uh, I won't get into a lot of detail on how to separate these. But I will mention a little bit about both, but primarily the uh, eastern willet. And then our greater yellow legs and lesser yellow legs. And notice the size difference between these 14 inches versus 10 and a half. So let's start with the willet. They have a long, thick bill. And when they're in breeding plumage, it's very striking the amount of dark brown, heavily barring that they have on them. <clears throat> Non-breeding, they look very different, very grayish. And the <coughs> what stands out the most on these birds, if they're flying, the wing pattern, this black and white wing pattern is very visible. And they're usually calling a lot. Uh, pill, this pill will will it, pill will will it that they give. Uh, very easy to identify these when they're on near their nests and the nesting grounds. Generally, you'll find them in salt marshes during the nesting season. But you can find them in mud flats, beaches, etc. So yeah, these are our breeder. But you can also find populations that migrate through. Uh, just a quick little summary here. And then we'll forget about the willets. Generally, eastern willet is smaller than the western willet. It has a shorter, thicker bill, as opposed to this longer, thinner bill. And they have shorter legs than the western willet. Western willets primarily migrate through in the fall. You occasionally can see some in the springtime in breeding plumage, but that's more the exception than the rule. Generally, they're around in fall migration. Eastern willets you can get spring, summer, and fall. And of course, summer for the breeders. Greater yellow legs and lesser yellow legs. You would think, looking at these two side by side, it's easy to separate them because they're so different in size and shape and their bills. But when you've got single birds, then you run into some problems. It's a little more problematic. So greater yellow legs. Now look at breeding versus non-breeding. They look different. But look at the bills. It's a long, thin bill. And usually they're bicolored, unless it's in full breeding plumage, then it tends to be darker. But usually you'll see this bicolored bill. And of course, they have long yellow legs. Habitats, marshes, uh, tidal mudflats, you know, anywhere where there's water, they'll be there. They'll be there. And primarily during migration is when you'll see this. Uh, they're very, <clears throat> very pretty in the spring in their breeding plumage. But these are on their ways up to the Arctic. Lesser yellow legs, they are slimmer than the greater yellow legs. And they have a shorter bill. It's thinner, straighter, 
and all dark. Legs are shorter, but they are yellow as well. And you can see here looking at breeding plumage versus a bird that's molting into non-breeding plumage versus a juvenile, the bill shapes are the same, the body shapes are the same, heads, everything's the same on these. So again, look at structures. So comparison between the two, of course, the size, but also the stockier body versus the slimmer body, the bill length, and you'll see that on the next slide that I show, uh, the bill length and the bill being slightly upturned and usually pale at the base. So let's go to the next slide. In the bill length here, it's generally one and a half to two times the head depth. So this is the head depth. And you can see that that's about one and a half times the length of the bill. Whereas with lesser yellow legs, it's about equal. So if the bill's about the same size as the head, the length, uh, then you've got lesser yellow legs. If it's much longer, you know, like one and a half at least, uh, then you're looking at greater yellow legs. But again, this can, this can be a little tough sometimes in the field. Uh, you notice here just a very slight upturn here. Some of them are much more upturned uh, in graders, but these are not upturned and it's shorter and thinner and daintier. And the way they feed, they both feed by picking or scything around, but greater yellow legs can be very active feeders, especially if they're feeding on small fish that might be in the water and they will be running around and uh, very active, just running and trying to grab fish. They, they look like they're, I don't know, hopped up on too much caffeine when they're doing this. And then the calls, if you hear lesser yellow legs, you're generally going to hear one or two, two notes going choo choo. But with a greater yellow legs, it's going to be three or more. So generally, I hear three or four when they're going choo, 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 choo. So this is good for also identifying one that you don't have a good look at. And in flight, they'll be doing these calls as well. Now the midsize. There are a lot of midsize. And I'll go through these group by group, separating the ones in each group. So we'll do the very inland winds, then the shorter legs, probers, the coastal species, the other mid-sized species, and then don't call them peep. Uh, these are called peep by some people, but they are not peep, the white rump and bears. Our very inland sandpipers, Wilson snipe and American woodcock. Both chunky bodies, both have very long bills. Uh, I know the woodcock has a prehensile bill where the tip of it, it can use it almost like a finger to grab worms underground. <coughs> Boy. Uh, look for the striped head on Wilson's, whereas on a woodcock, they have a banded head. It's barred across the top. They have a distinctly striped back that's very visible. Whereas you'll see the woodcocks do not and the barred flanks that they have. Whereas a, uh, a woodcock is very buffy, pretty much overall, but especially underneath, it's very buffy. And look where the eye is. Uh, woodcocks have an odd shaped head. It almost comes up like a like a cone and their eye is at the very top. So it's very high set. Yes? Oh, more water? <laughs> I have one water, but oh, thank you. All right, my assistant Marsha has helped me out here. All right, then we'll get into the shorter legged probers. And I have included stilt sandpipers with short-billed doucher and long-billed doucher because they are often feeding together, these three species. Um, chunky bodies for the two dowagers, whereas it's a slimmer body 
for the still sandpipers, it's a smaller bird. But the bills on short build, it's it's long and kinked. Generally, right towards the end, it kind of kinks, right about in here. Whereas long bill diarter, it's long and straight. And I'll mention bill lengths that with most shorebirds, female shorebirds have longer bills than the male shorebirds do. So this can be a problem for separating a few species because you can have female short billed dowagers that have longer bills than male long billed dowagers. So if they're very short, they're short bills. If they're very long, they're long bills, but then you have this overlap in the length of the bills. So you can't always go by the length of the bill. And then stilt sandpiper is much different. It has longer legs and then this shorter decurved bill as it curves down. A close up of their bills. Uh, you can see here the bill is long and kinked. Right about here, it starts to bend down a bit. Long bill darcher, it's just long and straight. And then the shorter decurved bill here for stilt sandpipers. Now, what do they look like in the water? Now, this particular bird is a long bill darcher, but this applies what I'm saying in both cases. Uh, Dowagers have longer bills and shorter legs. Stilt sandpipers have longer legs, but shorter bills and decurved. Now, why is this important? And again, look at the body size, how different it is on the two. When they're feeding, their feeding posture is different because dowagers have short bills, I'm sorry, long bills and short legs when they feed, they're basically horizontal. But stilt sandpipers, they have long legs and a short bill. So they have to tip over more, which then gives them that tipped up tail feeding posture. So if you see these all together, uh, short bills, long bills, and stilts, the stilts have quite a different posture to them. And the body size being slimmer. Now, this is something that may or may not help you. Uh, I don't always find this helpful, but short bill douchers generally have a flatter back, long bills generally a rounder back, and the hump is kind of in the middle of the back, whereas it's in the shoulders for short bill douchers. And they also, Long bills tend to look like they swallowed a grapefruit or a bowling ball. They're very round bellied. And I'll mention these plumages because you can't get into breeding plumages. It's just weight. There's subspecies to deal with, with uh, dowagers, short bill dowagers. And, uh, but I'll mention the juvenile dowagers in the fall. They're very, very diagnostic when they come out. Juveniles arrive generally in August for these short-billed dowagers. And the tertials that I mentioned here, these are the primaries back here. The tertials have all these internal markings in them on short bills. Long bills, they're not. They're just empty, no internal markings. And look at the bright feather edging, very orange feather edging on these birds. They're very striking when you see them in, in August. Now, long bills, generally they're coming later. You gotta get into the fall a little more. And you'll see this, that they have no, you know, no internal markings and they have very dull, it's almost hard to, hard to even see it, this dull reddish edging to their back feathers on the upper parts. And, uh, I didn't mention it before, but it was in one of the slides that spring migration is primarily April, May, with the majority of it being May. Whereas the fall migration starts around mid-July, mid 
you get a lot of shorebirds coming down that did not breed. And you'll get, they'll be kind of the first ones to arrive. Uh, and then you'll start getting them coming through in waves, different species and different ages and different sexes. So this all comes through. And generally long-billed dowagers, you're gonna see these more in the fall. And in the winter time, you may have a few of these winter moving. But again, separating the plumages, that, that's another whole presentation. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, this group, they tend to be together in the coast, uh, not together all together at the same place, but these are your coastal specialties. Uh, and we'll start with the biggest one, red knot, and work our way down to sander and the smallest one. Generally chunky, short legged, tubular tapered bill, and you'll see it kind of tapers from thick to thin, but it's tubular, uh, not pointed. And the best place to find these is in the springtime. That's primarily when you're looking for them and places where horseshoe crabs are mating. The Delaware Bay beaches are great for looking for red knots, even though their populations have dwindled over the years. Uh, this is, these are the places you wanna go looking for them. But look at them here. Look how the bills are the same, whether it's a juvenile, non-breeding or breeding. Uh, the body shape's the same. Everything's the same except for the plumage. So again, these are your tips to look for. Now, ready turnstone, a chunky bird. Good place to look for these are rock jetties, especially the ocean sea, the inlet in wintertime. But these are around during migration. They can be on mud flats. Uh, what I look for, well, there's a couple of things. The bill, look at the bill shape. It's the same on all your ages here and all your plumages. It's short and pointed. But another characteristic is this upside, what I call an upside down question mark on the chest and neck. It's there on all the plumages whether breeding, non-breeding, or a juvenile, you'll see that mark. And wintertime, this is what they'll look like down at Ocean City Jetty, generally like this. Very striking in breeding plumage. <clears throat> Another one of these winter specialties is purple sandpiper. We do get them during migration, but primarily the time to see them is in the winter and a great place is the Ocean City Inlet. They have bright orange legs. They have a bicolored bill that's orange at the base. And I'm only showing non-breeding birds because that's pretty much all you're gonna see uh, when they're here in the winter time. It's a long, thin, slightly decurved bill. And the color, they blend in with the rocks quite well. This is typical of what they look like. Uh, colors, of birds can look very different depending on the sun angle. If it's low in the sky, they can be very rich in color. If it's high in the sky, they can be very dull in color. So it depends on sun angle, how these things look. But this is typical of what they look like in wintertime. <coughs> Dunlin can be very numerous. Slightly chunky, long, black bill with a decurved tip, kind of a droop that you get out here. Uh, again, look at the structure. It's the same whether they're in breeding plumage or non-breeding plumage. They can be abundant in salt and fresh marshes, tidal mud flats, and you'll find these during migration and some in the winter. And then your smallest of the, the five coastal type species, Sanderling, slightly chunky. Look at the bill. It's short and straight and black in all cases. They do have black legs. Mostly you will see these looking kind of like this in non-breeding plumage. Uh, this one is molting from breeding plumage, so it still has some of its color. If it was in breeding plumage, 
like they are in the Arctic. It's very bright. They're stunning looking uh, if you get to see some in the springtime or early migration, early fall migration. But these are the ones that are running in and out with the surf. So you'll see these on the ocean beaches, just running in and out and in and out. So these purple sandpipers and ruddy turnstones, uh, those are very good for finding at the ocean city inlet on their on the rocks there. Then I've got four species that kind of they are other ones. They're not the coastal ones. These are more widespread. Um, things I want to mention about these one in breeding plumage, it's hard to miss what this is. It's a spotted sandpaper. But they're possible in all counties. They are a Maryland breeder. When they're standing or walking, you'll see them bobbing their tail up and down. They're kind of bobbing their body almost up and down. And when they fly, they have a very distinctive stiff, stiff wing beat. But one thing to look for besides their bills, and they do have a black eye stripe and a white supercilium in all their plumages, right in front of the wing here, this little patch, this white patch in front of the bended wing. And sometimes it can look much bigger than it's looking in these photos. But there's always this white patch that connects with the belly or the breast, I should say, connects with the breast. And uh, that's very apparent on these birds, uh, no matter what time of the year you see them. Solitaries. Solitaries can be very striking, again, in the springtime when they're moving through uh, on migration, uh, less so in the fall. And then juveniles, uh, they're, you know, kind of not as striking as some juveniles, but they're, they're nice looking. Uh, the main thing about these, look for that bold white eye line that's present on all the birds, any plumage, and look at the long, thin, straight bill. Uh, the bill, the uh, leg color is olive greenish, but it's not always that visible to see but it's another character you can look at. And these are found pretty much any of fresh marshes or pond edges, uh, look for them in muddy fields, again, during migration. Pectorals. Uh, pectorals are always kind of neat looking. They have these heavily streaked breasts. They're chunky and they have this straight tapered bill that's bicolored, it's pale at the base juvenile here and an adult here. It's pale, but it's not showing up as well in this photo. But again, the, the breasts on these are very, very heavily streaked. And usually you can find fresh marshes, salt marshes, any water edges, and in wet fields. Uh, some of these birds are considered grass pipers. Uh, American golden plovers are that way. Upland sandpipers are that way. And then, uh, there, I'll get that. And, all right. We'll get rid of that. And um, <clears throat> some of the, the other ones that we'll be covering here are grass pipers. You find them primarily in grasslands. Pecks can be found that way in grasslands. Buff breasted. These are very good to find on turf farms and plowed fields. Fall migration is the time for them. Otherwise, they're just, they're not here in the springtime. Fall migration is when to look for them. They're always buffy colored like this. And they have a very prominent black eye that sticks out from the buffiness. It really stands out when you see it. Uh, another one of the fall specialties in grasslands. And then the two that I said, don't call them peeps, white rump sandpipers, these are bigger. They're at least an inch to an inch and a half longer than the peeps. And the peeps will get through right after this. Um, both are migrants. Both have long wings that extend beyond the tail. Tail is like under here and the wings are much, much longer than the tail. 
Um, yeah, here you can see it even better. There's the tail and here's the wings. Uh, in flight, you'll see this white rump on the birds, but you don't always get that unless you wait for the things to fly. But in breeding plumage, they're pale brownish upper parts. They can have a lot of pinstriping on their breast and neck. Uh, to me, in the springtime, they look like uh, Yankee uniforms with the pinstriping on them. And they can have a lot of chestnut or rufous color on the crown and on the shoulders in these areas. And then in the, win in the winter time, the, uh, when they're non-breeding, they go into this gray plumage. So much different looking uh, plumage-wise, but structure-wise the same. And then bairds. <coughs> this is primarily a fall bird. It's unusual to get a bairds here in the springtime. So, and what you see are primarily juveniles. They, of course, they don't have the white rump as bear as white mumps do. Uh, they look pretty much the same structure as a white rump, and the wings, wings, whoops, wings do extend. Come back here. The wings do extend. Why are you doing that? Okay. Well, I'll just do this. They are uh, extended, but you see a lot of brownish coloration on the head and on the back. And since these are juveniles, I said all the feathers come in at the same time. So you get a lot of feather edging on these feathers on the back. So they look very, very scallopy uh, when you see these in the fall. Uh, I threw this in because it's such a rare photo of an adult seen in Maryland. Uh, they're much browner. You don't see the white feather edging, and they're not as scaly looking as these uh, juveniles are. These are very pretty birds when they come through in the fall. And then the smaller sandpipers, the peaks, least, semi, and western. And we'll start with least. Well, we'll do a real quick overview, then we'll go to least. Uh, they're all migrants. They can all be found on tidal mudflats, fresh and salt marshes, uh, muddy fields. Anywhere there's a little bit of water, uh, there's a good chance of finding these. The things to look for here structurally are the bills and the legs. Now, you'll notice that with least, they have a yellow leg, whereas the other ones have black legs. Now, that's good if you can see the yellow legs. But where they're foraging, it can be very muddy. So the yellow legs can then become black. So you can't always go by the color of the leg. But the bills are distinctive. If you look here, you see it's tapered, tapered to a point and slightly decurved towards the tip. Whereas semi palmated are more like a soda straw. It's kind of straight and tubular. Uh, it doesn't come to a point. It's more blunt, blunt edged down here. And then westerns have much bigger bills. They're much longer, uh, tapered, and slightly decurved. And it only, and often looks like they have a droop at the end. And in breeding plumage, these are very bright. They have a lot of chestnut in them. Uh, and I'll mention the uh, these uh, least sandpipers are generally brownish. They're browner than any of the other two. And here you can see them in breeding plumage, non-breeding plumage, and juvenile plumage. The bills are tapered, they're pointed, and slightly decurved a little bit. And the yellow legs that they've got. And always these are the darkest peaks. Semi-palmated, in breeding, they're more grayish. They don't have that deep brown coloration. Um, but the bills, it's more tubular and blunt tipped. So it's quite different than the uh, than least sandpipers. And generally, they're much a much grayer bird than you find, except in these juveniles. And then western sandpipers. 
these can be very pretty in their breeding plumage. Like I said, they can have a lot of chestnut in them. But look at the size of the bills. These are very long. Uh, to me, it almost looks, it gives me the impression that the bill is kind of starting almost in the forehead. Uh, they're longer, decurved, and often looks like a droop at the end of the bill. Now, this is another situation where separating semi-palmated and westerns. Female semi-palmateds can have bills that are longer than male western sandpipers. So again, you can't always go by the length of it. You have to look at the structure of the bill and how, it's, how it looks. And depending on the time of the year, you can look at the plumage as well. Look at the juvenile. Juveniles of these are very brightly colored. Lots of chestnuts when they're out. <coughs> and here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, I put in three different slides to show these. But you can see the bill length, generally it's longer, more decurved. The larger size of the bird, it's a little bit bigger not much, but a little bit bigger on these westerns. The western here, western here, and the western up front here. The heads are bigger, the necks are much thicker, and the bodies are chunkier. And in breeding plumage up here in the springtime, you'll see that the belly area and the breast area is clear. They don't have these arrow structures that you see in the westerns. Uh, they have a lot more in the breast area and down into the belly and along the flanks. But again, that's something that I'm throw, throwing in. It's not, <laughs> not one of the easy things to start with. Now, I think this is my last group, the spinning spinners, spinning swimmers. I was thinking of the the spinner singing. But Wilson's Fowler Oak, inland, this is your inland species that migrates through inland, whereas the other two are primarily pelagic, which is not to say you can't find them inland, but they're much rarer inland. And that's the situation with a lot of these shorebirds. Uh, they have places where they normally go, but they have wings, so they can really show up anywhere. Usually when you see these, they're floating on the water. And while they're floating, they're feeding, spinning around in circles. Uh, the females are much brightly more colored, or much more brightly colored in breeding plumage than males. And they're polyandrous, which means the females and males have role reversal. The females will mate with a male, she'll lay the eggs, and then she walks away and the male incubates the eggs. She goes and mates again, lays another patch of eggs, a uh, collection of eggs, and then walks away and leaves it to the second male to raise those. So this can go on for a while. And basically, she, had, she does nothing as far as <laughs> raising the young. Uh, occasionally, they're seen during migration or on winter pelagic trips. And it could be migratory pelagic trips as well. Uh, I just I wanted to show you the breeding females, even though you may not find these. Uh, but in the springtime, you can get some of these that come through that's that are going into breeding plumage. But look at the bills. And this, of course, like I said, it depends on the angle of the bird. It doesn't look as long there. But look at this bird where you're actually seeing it from the directly from the side. How long and thin this bill is on a non-breeding bird. And that's much different than the other two uh, species, the two pelagic species. Rednecked, you can see the bill, it's still thin and black, but it's much shorter. If you look at that, between that and this, it's much shorter in size. And the way to tell redneck fowler oaks any time of the year is if you see them and they have stripes on their backs. Uh, that's diagnostic for redneck fowlers, seeing these, uh, these stripes on their back. As opposed to the other pelagic species, 
red tail roach. Uh, now, in, when they're breeding in breeding plumage, yes, they do have stripes, but unless you're up on the breeding grounds, there's a good chance you're not going to see these uh, looking like that. Generally, when you're seeing them, they're looking more like this. Now, these are gray, like the, like the red breast, yeah, like the red necked. They're grayish, let's say, but these are pale gray and no stripes on the back. So if you see these out on the ocean uh, in winter pelagic trips, uh, they're going to look like this. Very gray. They're easier. They're easy to pick out and separate those versus the rednecks. Look for the stripes or the pale gray. So I threw these in, even though they're they are common, but not inland. They're more common offshore. So I will mention quickly again uh, the eight species that uh, hopefully will all be documented. I'm sure they will, but. And it would be wonderful if Wilson's plover started uh, breeding again in Maryland, nesting down at Assateague, but it's a long shot. And Wilson snipe, that's the one that would be great if it could be documented for breeding. So what you need, field guides. Your general field guides, if you're just gonna use a general field guide, I recommend to the uh, National Geo Field Guide, uh, has excellent, excellent images in there uh, for shorebirds, as well as gulls, terns, and other, other things. Uh, Sibley Guide is also good. It shows a lot of plumages of uh, what these birds will look like during the year. Then for specific shorebird guides, when I first started, there were only two. And Shorebirds, the identification guide that came in Marching and Prater. Uh, I used that. And when Paulson's book came out, that was very helpful. There are great images that are in the shorebirds of the Pacific Northwest that show you how to separate some of these species that occur, you know, that look very closely alike. And then you have the newer ones that have come out. Uh, Paulson's book. Shorebirds of North America, the photographic guide. Then you also have this one that came out by Message and, and uh, Taylor. And then the latest one, which is now 2006, uh, was Michael O'Brien, Richard Crossley, and Kevin Carlson, their shorebird guide. Uh, and this one has tons of photographs. Uh, very good, very good reference. So my photo acknowledgments, I can't thank enough Bill Kubik and Jim Stass. Um, without them, this would have been a much harder presentation to put together. Uh, probably 95% of the photos are from these two good friends and excellent photos. Then some supplementary photos. Uh, I was given this uh, copy of the Schubert ID Challenges and Identification Workshop that was created by Cindy Lepper, uh, John Bjorki, and Michael Bowen back in 2010. Uh, 2007 uh, for an MOS workshop that would be given. And the photographers who supplied photos for that workshop uh, gave permission to allow MOS to use their images. Uh, and the ones that I used in my presentation were from, from these people that are listed here. And then my biggest acknowledgement goes to my wife, Marsha Watson, for twisting my arm to create this presentation. <laughs> this is it's all her doing, getting me to do this. So with that, the presentation is over and how'd I do time-wise? About not bad. And that's it. Well, thank you very much, Jean. You're welcome. Great presentation. I'm just switching my camera view here so I see everybody. Um, and there, I just wanted to mention that last photo that Jean showed of the two of us. That was not a shorebird site. We were at Conowingo <laughs> Dam. <laughs> that was on a Christmas bird count a couple of years ago. Very cold day. And our friend Beth took that photo. So there are a couple of questions that have come into the chat to start things off. And I do invite everybody to enter more questions into the chat. So the first question, 
that came in from Sue and Alan Young is, do you find pectoral sandpipers in groups or as singles? Yes and yes. <laughs> uh, you can find them as singles, you can find them in groups. <laughs> Generally, when I have found them, they've not been in big groups, uh, maybe small numbers. I've never found tons of them together. The second question comes with a comment from Lisa Garrett. And she says she has seen Wilson snipe many times over the past few years at Schoolhouse Pond in Upper Marlboro. Does Fred Schaefer think that they, they might be nesting there? And Fred, of course, was our former president of Patuxent Bird Club who worked across the street from Schoolhouse Pond. And he used to visit there every day, year round, sometimes several times a day. So he knew the birds of Schoolhouse in and out, but he's retired now. So he doesn't hardly ever go there anymore. But Gene, what's your comment about nesting probability of Wilson's? Good question. Uh, like I said, they have not been documented nesting in Maryland at this point. Uh, the other spot that shows up tons of them are, what, what is the, uh, is it the place where um, Marcy Stutzman goes? Uh, Oxbow, Oxbow, Oxbow Lake. Lake. I know they mm -hmm. get tons of them there as well. Uh, now during breeding season, these were heard out in Garrett County, uh, but they could never document for certain that they were or were not breeding, but they were there during the breeding season. They were heard occasionally. So as far as breeding at Schoolhouse, uh, I don't know, uh, but they have not been documented. And when I've had them at Schoolhouse, it's been winter. So they were they were wintering birds, not... not um, You're they, right, Marcia. It wasn't it was winter. Season. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a long stretch. Um, you know, another place where they occur in large numbers and sometimes well into spring, but but I, I don't think there's any evidence of breeding is um, Chesapeake Farms in Kent County it used to be called Remington Farms. Right. Um, I used to do a bird survey there with David Holmes and, you know, we'd always have lots of Wilson snipe around, but there was, I don't think there was ever documentation of breeding there. We're just not quite in the right space for Wilson's snipe. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder about things like um, avocets, since we're starting to see them more often, if somewhere down the road, avocets might start breeding here and there. But right at the moment, I'll give that a long shot. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are seeing them much more. So, I mean, if white ibis started nesting here last year, who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like the black neck stilts at Hart Miller. Nobody ever thought they would breed there, but they did. Yeah. I mean, Hart, Hart Miller was such an exception during the last atlas to get things like black neck stilts breeding their um, uh, pie bill greaves. We had as many as 175 pie bill greaves there in one day. Uh, as many as 30 uh, least bitterns there. I mean, there were just ruddy ducks nesting there, uh, uh, common moorhens. I mean, it was, it was really, it was an incredible place during the last atlas. I have a question about one of those other rare birds, the woodcocks, about nesting. It was on your list of looking for nesting woodcocks. Yep. And Joanne Howell just, just posted yesterday that at Sands Road, where they see woodcocks quite commonly, have you, are you guys all aware that they want to turn it into a compost facility in the big field? Yes. Um, and, you know, um, with that information that Joanne sent from the public hearing at the Anne Arundel County Council, I was struck that um, there were no details on how much of the park would be turned into a composting facility. So it's really hard to understand what they want to do because they just didn't provide the details. Because mm -hmm. we went there one time and, and saw woodcocks, but they were doing their- The display. Their mm -hmm. display. There was, it wasn't proof that they actually nested there, but there definitely was proof that they were displaying there. Right. Um, in the chat, there are lots of compliments, Jean, from many people who attended, no actual questions. 
So I just Thank wanted you. to invite anybody who has a question. You can feel free to turn on your mic and speak your question if you wish. Yeah, like I can, like I say, uh, practice is the the main thing. That's how I learn them. Uh, going week after week after week, every weekend uh, to Bombay Hook. Uh, I got a greater appreciation of the various plumages. And uh, I'll mention, I'll mention two anecdotes, uh, not to brag, but just to mention them. Uh, when I was going to uh, Bombay Hook every weekend, I started you know, early May and I was going through May, June, July. And then in July, when I was there, I saw two dowagers. And I said, wow, these two dowagers look different than anything I have seen this year. They're brick red. They've got heavy barring underneath. Are these long-billed dowagers? So back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. And I drove to the visitor center at Bombay Hope. And I, I called Claudia Wilds and I said, hey, Claudia, I'm looking at these two dowagers out here and I, are they long-billed dowagers? And I described them to her and she said, Jean, you've earned them. You've been there every weekend, you've studied plumages and now when two long-billed dowagers show up, yes, they are long-billed dowagers and you earn them because you put in the time to learn them. So I said, oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so that was one of the anecdotes. The other anecdote, the very first time I went to Hart Miller Island uh, in the 19, uh, when would that have been? Well, I went out probably in the late 80s and the very early 90s. And I think I went out one time when I'd gotten my, my first scope and I, I needed a tripod. And I think I went to Walmart and got one of these flimsy things that looked like it was kind of built on soda straws. And I was standing out there in the wind and the things going in the wind. But the people I was out with were all what I would call shorebird experts. And I, at this point, I was just starting into shorebirds. And they're identifying things that are a mile away. They're identifying things flying by. Uh, oh yeah, that call, I heard that, that's a, and, and I'm thinking, Boy, am I out of my league. I don't, I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I can't tell anything that's flying by. And I said, I don't know that I'll ever be able to do this. So then, of course, after that, that's when I started at Bombay Hook. And then eventually I was going to Hart Miller every, every Saturday. And after a few years, uh, I had lots of people going out with me over the years. But one time I was out there with two of my I'll call them expert birding friends. And the two of them are having this discussion. We're looking at three birds that are about a mile away on the opposite side of the, of the uh, north cell out on the island. And it's easily about a mile away. And they're discussing, well, it's gotta be this. No, I can't be that. It's, I'm sure it's this. And they're, they're going back and forth debating. And I'm looking at the three birds and I said, well, why aren't they red knots? And they just kind of blew it off. So anyway, we finished walking about a mile and a half and got to the other side of the island. And the three birds were still there. And they were red knots. <laughs> and I thought, well, I guess coming out here every week has paid off because uh, I can identify these different plumages. Uh, you know, so it's, it's just a matter of practice getting out there learning the field guides, learning what's in field guides and learning the general structures of these birds so that you don't have to rely on plumage because the structures can tell you what the birds are. So anyway, that's my, my little advice. Dean, a question came in from Ken Cohen regarding your recommendations of field guides. And he noted <laughs> that you mentioned Sibley as a general field guide, but not Crosley. Why do you prefer Sibley over Crossley? Well, all I can say is I don't have Crossley. <laughs> so I really, can, I, I have no opinion on Crossley. I've always, I grew up 
on the Geo Guide uh, with Rick Blum. Um, Good answer. I did. Well, I, I grew up on the Geo Guide, and um, I've always used that as my go to guide. Uh, and I will then I'll supplement it with the sibling. But uh, Crosley, I've I think, Marcia, I may have bought it for you possibly one year. I don't know. But you I did. don't have it. I definitely don't have it. You did. It's on the shelf. Uh -huh. I'll have to look on Marsha's shelf. Any other questions for Jean? I, I just want to... Jean, hmm? when you go out, yeah. um, what do you keep, you know, handy to look at, um, to, you know, uh, you know, for references. You know, when it, when I go out, not only do I have my iPhone, but you know, my car, with my Sibley and my Crossley never leave the car. And I was wondering what what you used. Well, when I was going to Hart Miller, of course, I had to fit everything into a backpack, so I would only bring the geo guide with me out there. If I was going to Bombay Hook, any reference that I had that was Shorebird related, I would have with me in the car. So that if I had to look up something, I could look it up there. And of course, when I started doing all this, there weren't as many guides available as there are now. You, you have much bigger choice there were no apps, there were no cell phones, there was nothing back then. So it's, it's, uh, it was a little different when I was doing all this. Uh, was there one? Yeah, I don't see any more actual quite. questions. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone, what's that? I was just thanking everyone for all the comments here. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to remind everyone, I'm sure you haven't forgotten that next week, a week from tonight, we'll be having Michael O'Brien with us. We'll watch his video called The Art of Identifying Shorebirds that he produced for Vent. And then he will join us live for a question and answer, question and answer session. And um, his video on identifying shorebirds, um, it focuses on some of the more challenging pairs or trios of shorebirds to identify. So he'll walk us through those challenges. Oh, another question just came in from Sue and Alan Young. It seems like Western Willets and Western Sandpipers are around. Are they really Western? That's a good question. Well, and I mentioned Eastern and Western Willets uh, for another reason too. There is a possibility that down the road, these are gonna be split into two species. So, you know, they are different and the Western Willets do nest out West. They don't, they look very different in breeding plumage, uh, much less brownish color, coloration to the breast, much less uh, just color in general. Um, but yeah, the, the Western Willets and Eastern Willets, they stay apart when they're breeding. They're just, two different groups on two different ends of the continent. But, well, I shouldn't say different ends. They're out west, uh, not, the, not the west coast, but in the western part of the US for western willets. Um, but during migration is when we see these western willets, primarily in the fall migration, but we can occasionally get a few in the, in, during the, east, in the east during the, uh, the, the spring migration. Now, as far as Western sandpipers, you can get them here in the spring. And of course, none of these breed around here. They're all, you gotta go way up north for these. But uh, you can get some in the springtime and they're very, like I said, striking with this pinstriping that they have when you see them in the springtime. But they're, they are more common in the fall that you get. You can, you can get big flocks of these sometimes. Uh, I know we've had, back in the day, uh, you could have 100 or 200 out on Hart Miller Island during the fall migration on a, on a day. Oh, and I'll mention one other thing with Hart Miller. 
before I started going out there, um, there was one day where the people that were out there that day had Wilson's phalarope, redneck phalarope, and red phalarope, all three, same day, in the same scope field out on Hart Miller. So, I mean, Hart Miller was always just a, a wonderful place for shorebirds. Mm -hmm. Here in Prince George's County, you know, we really don't have a good shorebird spot per se. We sometimes get some yellow legs and spotties and solitaries turning up along the Patuxent River or in some of our ponds, but we don't really have a good um, a place where you see a wide selection of shorebirds. We kind of have to take them as we find them. Of course, killdeer are everywhere, um, but the rest you really have to search for here in, in Prince George's County. So that's why we're not too far away from the Delaware Bay Shore or Ocean City for that matter. Ocean City or, Inlet's wonderful in wintertime. Or, you know, another good place to go is um, the tours that MES sponsors at Poplar Island. There's usually a good selection of shorebirds out there. Last year, the tours were all canceled because of the virus, but I hope that they'll be starting them up again. If not this year, certainly next year. That's a good opportunity. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as you were describing the uh, uh, different field marks, I was following along in Peterson. And of course, uh, the uh, classic Peterson has been superseded by all the modern shorebird field guides. But I noticed that many times he, il he actually illustrated the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, field mark that you were mentioning, though never describing it, never me never mentioning it in the text, but illustrating it, and it uh, uh, would appear in the illustration. So I thought that was kind of remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, or anything uh, in particular or in general? Uh, yes, some in particular, like uh, the uh, thicker neck of the uh, Western Sandpiper, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember them all, but if you if you just go back and look at your Peterson, you'll you'll see that. And there are other examples. Another shorebird place, maybe, but you have to hesitate mentioning it, is the uh, sewage pond at uh, Bark in, in the in the fall, and that can, that can have uh, uh, good shorebirds, though access is controlled. Yeah, it's restricted to, access. Yeah, you have to. Uh, uh, undergo a procedure to, to go there. Right. Yeah. The best thing to do if you want a bird at Bark is volunteer for the Christmas bird count or the spring bird count or the fall <laughs> bird count when you will be given permission. Um, someone asked if the recording will be posted somewhere for all of us to study it more. Yes, indeed. Um, I can't tell you what, what yet where it will be posted, but the recording is actually still running. I haven't turned it off yet. And I will find a place to put it and send the link out to everybody who registered. Since Jean, Jean, Jean did receive permission from the photographers to uh, save the recording and share it with people. So we can do that. I'm glad we can. <laughs> I like Janine's comment. <laughs> yeah, she was writing as fast as she could. <laughs> so I think that's probably I, it for our questions. Oh, wait, Janine has one page, more. Go five ahead. pages of notes. Oh, five pages oh, of notes. Wow. Okay. I used, I used to lead lots of field trips to Bombay Hook, <clears throat> primarily for the uh, Baltimore Bird Club and Patuxent Bird Club. And, and now I'm choking again. And Hart Miller, uh, you can imagine going out there every Saturday over from 96 till 2008. And I used to have lots of people come with me and I would lead lots of field trips for the various bird clubs out there over the years. And it was always fun to do that. And I always told people if they got a life bird when they were out there, then they were going to treat everybody to dinner when we got off the island. <laughs> oh, not just dinner, steamed crabs. Steamed crabs. It's that the happens. menu of choice. <laughs> <laughs>
And Fred and Fred Fallon used to lead it. And I think, are you still going to lead it when we get back to having field trips? Fred Fallon has traditionally led a Memorial Day weekend field trip to the Delaware Bay shore. And we've always gotten good shore birds on that, hitting a number of spots along the shore. Well, it's, it's a different situation today as far as things like carpooling and the like. But for those uh, uh, present right now, what would be a sure a show of hands as to uh, indication of interest in, in uh, such a trip? Don't everybody shout at once? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm probably not going to be able to see all the hands. Um, if you go down to at the bottom of your screen where it says reactions, you can actually do a thumbs up sign on reactions. So I'm seeing thumbs up or appearing. Okay. So it, it okay. looks like there are there are votes to there, do so. There are some. Yeah. Um, so you know, um, I guess now we're kind of morphing into the bird club meeting portion of the of the evening. Um, spring count is this coming Saturday, May eighth, and our Fred has stepped down as coordinator. But I wanted to thank him for his many years of service in that role. And he has turned over the reins on organizing the spring count to Matt Felperin. And I'm just gonna turn the recording off now because we don't need to catch all this. <laughs> 